The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber by Ernest Hemingway It was now lunchtime, and they were all sitting under the double green fly of the dining tent, pretending that nothing had happened. Will you have lime juice or lemon squash? Macomber asked. I'll have a gimlet, Robert Wilson told him. I'll have a gimlet too. I need something, Macomber's wife said. I suppose it's the thing to do, Macomber agreed. Tell him to make three gimlets. The mess boy had started them already, lifting the bottles out of the canvas cooling bags that sweated wet in the wind that blew through the trees that shaded the tents. What had I ought to give him? Macomber asked. A quid would be plenty, Wilson told him. You don't want to spoil them. Will the head man distribute it? Absolutely. Francis Macomber had, half an hour before, been carried to his tent from the edge of the camp in triumph on the arms and shoulders of the cook, the personal boys, the skinner and the porters. The gun bearers had taken no part in the demonstration. When the native boys put him down at the door of his tent, he had shaken all their hands, received their congratulations, and then gone into the tent and sat on the bed until his wife came in. She did not speak to him when she came in, and he left the tent at once to wash his face and hands in the portable wash basin outside and go over to the dining tent to sit in a comfortable canvas chair in the breeze and the shade. You have got your lion, Wilson said to him, and a damn fine one. Mrs. Macomber looked at Wilson quickly. She was an extremely handsome and well-kept woman, of the beauty and social position which had, five years before, commanded $5,000 as the price of endorsing, with photographs, a beauty product, which she had never used. She had been married to Francis Macomber for 11 years. He is a good lion, isn't he? Macomber said. His wife looked at him now. She looked at both of these men as though she had never seen them before. One, Wilson, the white hunter she knew she had never truly seen before. He was about middle height with sandy hair, a stubby moustache, a very red face, and extremely cold blue eyes with faint white wrinkles at the corners that grooved merrily when, she, when he smiled. He smiled at her now, and she looked away from his face, at the way his shoulders sloped in the loose tunic he wore, with the four big cartridges held in loops where the left breast pocket should have been, at his big brown hands, his old slacks, his very dirty boots, and back to his red face again. She noticed where the baked red of his face stopped in a white line that marked the circle left by his Stetson hat that hung now from one of the pegs of the tent pole. Well, here's to the lion, Robert Wilson said. He smiled at her again and, not smiling, she looked curiously at her husband. Francis Macomber was very tall, very well built if you did not mind that length of bone, dark, his hair cropped like an oarsman, rather thin-lipped and was considered handsome. He was dressed in the same sort of safari clothes that Wilson wore, except that his were new. He was 35 years old, kept himself very fit, was good at court games, had a number of big game fishing records, and had just shown himself very publicly, to be a coward. Here's to the lion, he said. I can't thank you for what you did. Margaret, his wife, looked away from him and back to Wilson. Let's not talk about the lion, she said. Wilson looked over at her without smiling, and now she smiled at him. It's been a very strange day, she said. Hadn't you ought to put on your hat, even under the canvas at noon? You told me that, you know. Might put it on, said Wilson. You know you have a very red face, Mr. Wilson, she told him and smiled again. Drink, said Wilson. I don't think so, she said. 
Francis drinks a great deal, but his face is never red. It's red today, Macomba tried the joke. No, said Margaret, it's mine that's red today. But Mr. Wilson's is always red. Must be racial, said Wilson. I say, you wouldn't like to drop my beauty as a topic, would you? I've just started on it. Let's chuck it, said Wilson. Conversation is going to be so difficult, Margaret said. Don't be silly, Margot, her husband said. No difficulty, said Wilson. Got a damn fine line. Margot looked at them both, and they both saw that she was going to cry. Wilson had seen it coming for a long time and he dreaded it. Macomba was past dreading it. I wish it hadn't happened. Oh, how I wish it hadn't happened, she said, and started for her tent. She made no noise of crying, but they could see that her shoulders were shaking under the rose-coloured, sun-proofed shirt she wore. Women upset, said Wilson to the tall man. Amounts to nothing. Strain on the nerves and one thing and another. No, said Macomba. I suppose that I raked for the rest of my life now. Nonsense. Let's have a spot of the giant killer, said Wilson. Forget the whole thing. Nothing to it anyway. We might try, said Macomba. I won't forget what you did for me though. Nothing, said Wilson. All nonsense. So they sat there in the shade, where the camp was pitched under some wide-topped acacia trees, with a polder-strewn cliff behind them, and a stretch of grass that ran to the bank of a boulder-filled stream in front, with forest behind it, and drank their just cool lime drinks, and avoided one another's eyes, while the boys all knew about it now. And when he saw Macumba's personal boy looking curiously at his master while he was putting dishes on the table, he snapped at him in Swahili. The boy turned away with his face blank. What were you telling him? Macumba said. Nothing. Told him to look alive that I'd see he'd got fifteen of the best. What's that? Lashes? It's quite illegal, said Wilson. You're supposed to find them. Do you still have them whipped? Oh, yes. They could raise a row if they chose to complain. But they don't. They prefer it to the fines. How strange, said Macomba. Not strange, really, Wilson said. Which would you rather do? Take a good birching or lose your pay? Then he felt embarrassed at asking it, and before Macomba could answer, he went on. We all take a beating every day, you know, one way or another. This was no better. Good God, he thought. I'm a diplomat, aren't I? Yes, we take a beating, said Macomba, still not looking at him. I'm awfully sorry about that lion business. It doesn't have to go any further, does it? I mean... No one will hear about it, will they? You mean, will I tell it at the Mataiga Club? Wilson looked at him now coldly. He had not expected this. So he's a bloody four-letter man as well as a bloody coward, he thought. I rather liked him too until today. But how is one to know about an American? No, said Wilson. I'm a professional hunter. We never talk about our clients. You can be quite easy on that. It's supposed to be bad form to ask us not to talk, though. He had decided that to break now would be much easier. He would eat then by himself, and he could read a book with his meals. They would eat by themselves. He would see them through the safari on a very formal basis. What was it the French called it? Distinguished consideration and it would be a damn sight easier than having to go through this emotional trash. He'd insult him and make a good clean break. Then he could read a book with his meals and he'd still be drinking their whiskey. That was the phrase for it when Safari went bad. You ran into another wild hunter and you asked, How's everything going? And he answered, 
Oh, I'm still drinking their whiskey. And you knew that everything had gone to pot. I'm sorry, Wakamba said, and looked at him with his American face that would stay adolescent until it became middle-aged. And Wilson noted his crew-cropped hair, fine eyes, only faintly shifty, good nose, thin lips, and handsome jaw. I'm sorry I didn't realise that. There are lots of things I don't know. So what could he do? Wilson thought. He was all ready to break it off quickly and neatly. And here the beggar was apologising after he had just insulted him. He made one more attempt. Don't worry about me talking, he said. I have a living to make. You know, in Africa, no woman ever misses her line, and no white man ever bolts. I bolted like a rabbit, Macomba said. Now, what in hell were you supposed to do about a man who talked like that? Wilson wondered. Wilson looked at Macomba with his flat, blue, machine gunner's eyes, and the other smiled back at him. He had a pleasant smile if you did not notice how his eyes showed when he was hurt. Maybe I can fix it up on Buffalo, he said. We're after them next, aren't we? In the morning, if you like, Wilson told him. Perhaps he'd been wrong. This was certainly the way to take it. You most certainly could not tell a damn thing about an American. He was all former cumber again. If you could get, forget the morning. But of course, you couldn't. The morning had been about as bad as they come. Here comes the Memsab, he said. She was walking over from her tent, looking refreshed and cheerful and quite lovely. She had a very perfect oval face, so perfect that you expected her to be stupid. But she wasn't stupid, Wilson thought. No, not stupid. How is the beautiful red-faced Mr. Wilson? Are you feeling better, Francis, my pearl? Oh, much, said Mugamba. I've dropped the whole thing, she said, sitting down at the table. What importance is there to whether Francis is any good at killing lions? That's not his trade. That's Mr. Wilson's trade. Mr. Wilson is really very impressive at killing anything. You do kill anything, don't you? Oh, anything, said Wilson. Simply anything. They are, he thought, the hardest in the world. The hardest, the cruelest, the most predatory and the most attractive. And their men have softened or gone to pieces nervously as they have hardened. Or is it that they pick men they can handle? They can't know that much at the age they marry, he thought. He was grateful that he had gone through his education on American women before now, because this was a very attractive one. We're going after Buff in the morning, he told her. I'm coming, she said. No, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Mayn't I, Francis? Why not stay in camp? Not for anything, she said. I wouldn't miss something like today for anything. When she left, Wilson was thinking, when she went off to cry, she seemed a hell of a fine woman. She seemed to understand, to realise, to be heard for him and for himself, and for herself, and to know how things really stood. She is away for twenty minutes and now she's back, simply enamelled in that American female cruelty. They are the damnedest women. Really, the damnedest. We'll put on another show for you tomorrow, Francis Macomber said. You're not coming, said Wilson. You're very mistaken, she said. And I want to so to see you perform things again. You were so lovely this morning. That is if blowing things heads off is lovely. <laughs>